Good evening and welcome to a new episode of Al Shabaka's Policy Labs. I'm Nadim Bawalsa, Al Shabaka's Commissioning Editor. For our first Policy Lab of 2023, we examined developments in the boycott movement with particular focus on the corporate sector. Over the last few years, Palestine solidarity activists across the world have been pressuring corporations to acknowledge the Israeli regime's violations of Palestinian rights. As a result, companies like Ben & Jerry's, Veolia, and Pillsbury, among others, have been terminating their involvement with the Israeli apartheid regime, although to, ver to varying ex extents. Certainly, these companies didn't suddenly develop moral compasses and decide to boycott Israel for its atrocities. Nor are many of these boycotts sustained in the longer term. On the one hand, we ask, to what can these developments in the boycott movement be attributed? What exactly goes on behind the scenes, and who is involved in making all of this happen? On the other hand, we reflect on some of the limitations of these successes, and we ask, how hopeful should we be for a proliferation in corporate boycotts of Israel moving forward? To answer these questions and many more, I'm joined tonight by Sandra Tamari and Omar Barghouti, two leading organizers in the growing global movement to defend Palestinian rights. Sandra Tamari is a Palestinian organizer and the executive director of Adala Justice Project, AJP. She's a co-founder of the St. Louis Palestine Solidarity Committee and was co-chair of the steering committee for the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights from 2015 to 2018. She was the lead organizer of the Palestinian contingent to Ferguson, Missouri in October 2014. Tamari holds a master's degree in Arab studies from Georgetown, Georgetown University's Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. Al Shabaka policy analyst Amar Barghouti is a Palestinian human rights defender and co founder of the Palestinian led boycott, divestment, and sanctions BDS movement for Palestinian rights. He is a co recipient of the 2017 Gandhi Peace Award. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from Columbia University, and he is pursuing a PhD in philosophy at the University of Amsterdam. He is the author of BDS, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights. His commentaries and views have appeared in many mainstream outlets, including the New York Times, The Guardian, MSNBC, CNN, and Le Monde, among others. Welcome to you both, and thank you for being with us uh, this evening. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to inform our viewers of the format of this policy lab. For the first 30 minutes or so, I'll pose uh, questions to Sandra and Omar. During the second half of the lab, they will answer questions from you. Throughout the discussion, please submit your questions by clicking on the Ask a Question button below. And remember that you can vote on the questions you'd like asked. If possible, please direct your question to one of our speakers. I will do my best to address as many of your questions as I can. Let's begin. Omar, uh, I'd like to start with you. Um, we've been hearing of more and more successes in the BDS movement to pressure corporations to end their complicity uh, in Israel's grave human rights violations against the Palestinians. Uh, this includes Ben & Jerry's, Booking.com, Veolia, Pillsbury, HP, uh, G4S, among others. On the one hand, um, to what would you attribute this success? On the other hand, there have been limits to these successes. What are they and how would you explain them? Uh, thanks, Nadim, uh, for having this important uh, conversation. Uh, unfortunately, it's happening on a day when Israel just committed yet another massacre in the Jenin refugee camp. Uh, so far, 10 Palestinians have been killed, including an elderly woman and children. Uh, it's devastating. But this is the moment when we call on everyone, if you're angry, channel your anger into more BDS, into more accountability mechanisms and campaigns. So companies that are enabling Israel's uh, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity uh, must be held accountable. And, and this is the starting point. Uh, we're not asking companies to be moral because they, they're not in, in, in the large, absolute large majority, but we know that they understand the language of profits uh, reputation, reputational damage, uh, and the bottom line. So that's what we do. Activists everywhere, BDS activists, when they pressure a company, uh, they make sure to send a very strong message that if unless you end your complicity with Israel's entire regime of settler colonialism, apartheid and military occupation, you shall pay a price. We, we're not asking here for any solidarity from you. We will make you heed our rights or else you'll pay a price. And indeed with Veolia, for example, and we can talk about many of the companies you've mentioned, we, after losing billions and billions of dollars, Veolia was pushed out of the Israeli market entirely. 
uh, G4S lost a lot of its reputation and left some of the markets still on our boycott list, HP, and so on and so forth. So it's really pressure, and that needs strategic, effective campaigning. It's not just about having the right principles. It's having the right tools, the right strategies. And, and that differs from one company to another. You cannot use the same toolbox with every company because you have a, a, a Ben and Jerry's where you have a very socially responsible board of directors. And, and Sandra, I'm sure we'll talk much more about that. And you have companies like Caterpillar and, and uh, military companies that have absolutely no moral compass and will require a lot more pressure. Uh, so that depends. Can we affect that company? Yes or no? How can we affect it? These are the strategy questions that we always ask ourselves. But ultimately, no company bows to pressure from human rights defenders unless it really feels the pain of loss of profits, of tenders, or reputational. It, it, it suffers reputational damage to the extent that it starts affecting its bottom line. Thank you, Omar, for uh, for this this very succinct explanation of what really is at stake when we talk about corporate or corporations seeking accountability for Israel. Um, Sandra, let's 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 go on to talk about movement building uh, and uh, raising awareness across the U.S., which is is at the core of what Adana Justice Project does. Um, as executive director of AJP, you're at the helm of these efforts to raise awareness across the U.S. about Israel's apartheid occupation. Uh, a key component of this has been movement building. Uh, can you tell us more about what goes into this process and about some of the successes and challenges you and other Palestine solidarity activists uh, have faced and continue to face doing so in the United States? Thank you so much, Nadim. It's really an honor to be here with you and Omar. And um, it's an important conversation given the events of this morning in Janine. Um, we do need to channel, as Omar said, our rage into action. And so this conversation is timely. Um, movement building simply is uh, building solidarity across movements and with people who share our values. And a lot of the, the work that we did around Ben and Jerry's really did come out of uh, Black uh, struggle and Black movement. And so I want to just kind of like talk a little bit about how we built into that uh, campaign. Um, Black-led protest in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in the summer of 2020 propelled a racial reckoning in the United States that, of course, built on other protests um, in Ferguson, where I am um, in August of 2014, earlier with the murder of Trayvon Martin in Florida. And we continue to feel its reverberations of this Black you know, reckoning, um, you know, a call for accountability and for justice and for the end of state violence. And it's a revolution that is, you know, still seeking its end, right? It's still seeking accountability and full liberation. Um, and simply put, like I said, movement building requires solidarity and it requires showing up for people in their time of need. And I'm happy to say that our movement our, and Palestinians did show up globally in solidarity with black struggle tangibly in the summer of 2020. Um, less so in 2014. And I think that our movement really built uh, an understanding of the connections of our oppression. You know, we as a movement uh, built the connective tissue that binds an understanding of our oppression, Black and Palestinian. Israel and the U.S., as we know, engage in police exchanges. We are tear gassed with the same canisters from the same companies. Uh, the U.S. is increasingly militarizing its police of Black and brown communities um, and at the border, using Israeli technologies and tactics, lab tested, um, as we know, on Palestinians in Gaza and across Palestine. And this solidarity is more than a feeling. It's more than a notion. It is a verb, as the saying goes. And the movement for Black Lives really encapsulated that, that solidarity in April of 2021. Um, they, they reached out to me, uh, friends within the movement for Black Lives, to ask about Ben and Jerry's. Um, my friend said, Ben and Jerry's is calling us. They want to do a partnership. They want to talk about um, a partnership, releasing an ice cream brand um, and, you know, working on legislation to combat police brutality. And they said, we know that they are on the BDS list. You know, the 
campaign against Ben and Jerry's is a decade old. Vermonters for Justice in, in Palestine have been working diligently to raise uh, the alarms on a very, very strategic target. Um, ben and Jerry's has been producing and selling um, their product inside Israel for some time. Um, but Movement for Black Lives said, you know, we, we, your, our partnership with you, our commitment to you is much more important than anything that Ben and Jerry's can offer us. And so the Movement for Black Lives made it very clear. These are the Palestinian demands. We won't work with you unless you, are, you meet these demands. And soon after, in the summer of 2021, Ben and Jerry's made the announcement that they were ceasing sales of their products in the settlements. So in this way, you can see how a local campaign started in Vermont and then supported by a national organization like ours with these deep ties to cross movement partners can be very powerful. And in the end, you know, Ben and Jerry's is now completely out of, uh, out of Palestine, is not doing business in any part of, of Palestine. And, you know, they have tried to create a scheme, you know, they've, they're scheming desperately to give the appearance that they're still there, but they, they, have, they have pulled out. Um, and as Omar said, you know, Ben and Jerry's didn't do this because, you know, they have a moral compunction. They, they're the only company that said that the reason that they pulled out was for ethics. But they're not, a, they're not a unicorn. It's not about ethics in the end. It's about public pressure. It was a reputational issue. Um, and they wanted to be on the right side of racial justice in the U.S. And it became very apparent to them that they couldn't exclude Palestine from that analysis. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you for um, uh, offering so many examples about just what goes into this this process. And it's it's really uh, it's very moving to hear that that Palestine solidarity extended to to the Black Lives Movement so much during your your, your campaigning. Um, Hamad, uh, excuse me, Omar, let's uh, go back to you and let's move away from the U.S. for a moment to talk about what more needs to be done to push for BDS against uh, Israel at the corporate level uh, globally. Uh, are there specific strategies that Palestinians and their allies can implement to expand uh, this, this campaign? Yes, thanks Nadim for this, because quite often in the US and Western Europe, activists may think that, you know, that's the entire world. You know, with the colonial uh, countries, it's very easy to fall into that trap, but the world is much bigger. Uh, and BDS indeed works across the global south, not just the global north, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia. Uh, um, now we're expanding our work in Africa well beyond South Africa. In, uh, across 2022 20, countries in Africa, now we're having a BDS campaigning in Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and so on. So, uh, as I said, it, it, there isn't a one size fits all. It, it does matter. The context does matter how we approach a company. So, for example, a company that like HP. HP uh, uh, is deeply involved in Israel's uh, apartheid system. They still, uh, although they pulled out of uh, a lot of their uh, um, uh, initial uh, complicit projects, they're still very involved with uh, police, Israeli police, with all their brutality and war crimes that, they've, that they commit. So HP is, is guilty. But HP is not just guilty of violating Palestinian rights, they're guilty uh, of many other things across the world. So we see the intersections between our struggle, our liberation struggle, with other justice struggles, be it racial justice, social justice, as Sandra mentioned, climate justice, we're increasingly working a lot with progressive climate justice groups, especially in the global south, and people of color in the global north, increasingly, we're working together on, on connecting the climate justice issue with justice for Palestinians. So when we target a company, we look at how deeply complicit it is, whether it is offending other communities and how to connect with those other communities, whether the company is a monopoly or it can be impacted by our campaign, because if it's a monopoly, then the chances of success are very slim, then we don't start a campaign against this company. We keep it for a better day. So we, we, we discuss all these uh, issues and depending on every country. I'll give an example in the UK, where we have massive solidarity uh, in, in the public, among artists, among academics, just massive solidarity in the UK. When we pressure city councils to exclude a company like Veolia, like uh, Caterpillar, like JCB or Hyundai Heavy Industries from public tenders, 
we don't go begging and asking for charity. We tell city councillors that unless you exclude this company, which is involved in grave human rights violations, uh, you won't be elected. We have the numbers. If you go with a petition signed by 50 or 100 people, they'll laugh at you. But if you go with a petition signed by thousands, they take you seriously. They know they can lose the elections next time. So with politicians, that's how we do it. With companies, we affect uh, 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 their margins and their profits and their reputation. Uh, media becomes a very important tool. And if we're excluded and silenced in some traditional mainstream media, we're not as excluded in social media, although it's also a battle in social media. I mean, Facebook and, and Twitter and so on are not exactly allies. <laughs> They're extremely anti-Palestinian. But, but we do succeed in, in uh, quite often in getting our story out there and pressuring uh, the companies. When you have a Microsoft, for example, Bill Gates claiming to be supportive of human rights and progressive and anti-poverty and so on, when we targeted the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to divest from uh, G4S, which was involved in Israeli prisons, a security company providing security for settlements, checkpoints, prisons uh, uh, that are uh, oppressing our people across the, uh, the Palestine, it wasn't as hard as pressuring a company like G4S, a security company. So with the Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, <clears throat> we, we've, we put out at that time some very flashy graphics with Bill Gates standing in front of an Israeli checkpoint in the image and saying, yeah, I care about fighting poverty and I support all progressive jobs, but not in Palestine. Things of that sort were extremely effective <clears throat> because he cares about his reputation and so on. So the, those tactics vary from one company to another, from one country uh, to another. If we're campaigning against a company in Malaysia, let's say, where you have wall-to-wall -wall support for Palestinian rights, you can, you can imagine how much easier it is than campaigning against a company in Germany or France, let's say, you know, colonial uh, countries that are, have a lot of racism and support Israel as, as their own settler colonial outgrowth, basically. Uh, um, so we, as activists, we have to vary our tactics and know what to attack, when to attack, and how to attack. What Sandra mentioned is very important, how to form alliances, because we cannot do it alone. So forming intersectional alliances becomes extremely important, uh, uh, putting principles first, but also agreeing on strategies. So we never uh, gave, give up our, our main principles, but we are flexible enough when it comes to tactics and strategies to accommodate some differences. We cannot achieve everything we want in every campaign, so we try to accommodate uh, uh, differences. Thank you, Omar. I, I actually think that's that's a perfect segue to the next question for Sandra, which is really about the the, uh, the intricacies of this, this intersectional uh, movement building. Uh, one of the challenges in your line of work is encouraging those in solidarity to do more to like whether to do more than sign a petition or retweet a tweet or uh, so on um, based on your experience what would you say is needed to make that push happen where the palestine solidarity movement is more expansive intersectional inclusive and ultimately successful at shifting policy around uh, palestine yeah thank you so much for that question I mean, I think that Omar experiences this too. You know, the first question I often hear is, what's the, what's the list? Who's on the BDS list? I won't buy them. I won't engage with them. Um, I individually am boycotting these, uh, these companies. I, this is the wrong approach. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, this is, you know, BDS campaigns are not built from individual action. Um, it's, it really is organizing. It is bringing together a community to put public pressure on these corporations to end their complicity with Israel. Um, many of these companies we don't, you know, have the opportunity to buy from. I don't do business with Veolia. They're not, you know, my waste management company. And these, you know, it's very easy to say, you know, I don't, uh, I don't engage with G4S. Many of us are not hiring private security uh, to come and do any kind of work for us. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, you know, the Ben and Jerry's campaign was born locally by a dedicated group of activists in Vermont who chose this a BDS target strategically. They chose a company they believe they could move based on their stated commitment to peace and equity. And, you know, they had a local base of operations. They had access to, you know, the company. So, you know, this is the reason why they were a strategic uh, target. 
So if you're thinking about starting a BDS campaign in your, you know, your church, your city, uh, in a grassroots formation, in your union or in your university, you know, it's important, as Omar said, to think, you know, about what target makes sense, who has a tie to your local context, which companies is your city doing business with, uh, Who's receiving a subsidy? Subsidy from you know your city or your university um, is doing business with, um, and so I'll give an example of how we built a campaign here in St. Louis. Um, in 2012, we learned that Veolia, um, who is now uh, pulled entirely out of doing business with Israel, uh, was bidding on a consulting contract with the city's water authority, and we found out about this contract track because. One of our members did something very simple, set up a Google alert um, on several corporations uh, on the BDS list and coupled that with St. Louis. And this contract came up. And the reason why it was in the news, a very uh, small article, was because the water, uh, the employees, the municipal employees of the water company were very concerned about uh, Veolia's bid and their, um, they were coming in to do efficiency studies on the water authority and uh, basically to make recommendations to the city on how to save money. Um, and we all know when uh, private companies start sniffing around, uh, what it means is that jobs are lost, uh, very high paying municipal jobs are lost and uh, the company, the private company takes the, over these jobs and continues to make cuts until uh, the water uh, becomes uh, you know, dangerous, becomes poisonous. Um, as we know, in so many cities this happened. Uh, when private companies have taken uh, taken control. Um, and so we went to uh, a committee meeting in the in the city of St. Louis, City Hall. There were nine of us that went and we were just asking the committee that was considering the contract to investigate Veolia. That was our very simple uh, you know message. And this small committee of three had never seen any community <laughs> organizing in their meetings. They'd never had anyone attend their public meetings. And so nine people showing up um, gave them pause. And so uh, two people decided that the vote needed to be postponed until they looked further into the company. That started a year long campaign where we were able to um, form a coalition with uh, labor, with internationalists in the city, uh, including black uh, black organizers, and uh, most importantly, in this instance, with environmental uh, organizations and, and people that were concerned about the environment, um, worried about the privatization of, of you know, this important resource in our city. Um, the St. Louis Dump Veolia campaign um, caused the, the issue to be raised at the mayoral uh, race level. Um, our, the candidate that was supporting <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our stance and demanding that Veolia be pushed out did not win the election, as you're saying, Omar, in, in the UK. We lost that, uh, that electoral race, but what we did uh, do is raise the issue to such a high level within the city that people were uh, asking it in every uh, public forum. Uh, finally, the city council, the board of aldermen, uh, decided to have two sessions, uh, open hearings about the issue. Um, the sessions lasted over six hours. Um, 150 people attended at least each of the of the hearings, um, and everyone was voicing concerns about the contract. The most important part of this is the narrative that was set. You know, while the coalition's uh, tagline was "Save Our Water," it was very clear that it was Palestinians that the, were the ones that were bringing out the numbers and bringing the energy to this campaign. And the testimonies that happened during these town halls really were talking about the direct impacts that people in St. Louis, Palestinians in St. Louis, were had suffered under Veolia's, you know, the policies that Veolia was 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 supporting, segregated bus lines, um, checkpoints that you know that were built to protect settlements, for, you know, keeping people off of their land, um, and this is what really resonated with the city council. And in the end, there were only, uh, Veolia was, was the only, uh, Veolia spokespeople were the only people that were able to speak um, in favor of the contract. There was one local Jewish group that did show up. They, um, they said that they, uh, they, were, they, they didn't have an opinion about the contract. 
<laughs> because they knew it was untenable to be against this contract because of the wide, uh, the wide controversy in the city around it. But they said, please don't make this about Palestine. <laughs> if, you, if you reject the contract, just don't make it about BDS. Um, and in the end, Veolia pulled their bid. Uh, it was so uh, damaging to their reputation. They issued a statement and just said, this isn't worth it. We're pulling our bid and, and just showing you that it's pressure. It's pressure and organizing that wins these campaigns. Thank you, Sandra. These uh, these examples are really enriching. Um, it's giving us a sense of exactly how much work it takes to get to get somewhere with with, uh, with these boycott campaigns. Um, I'd like to move on to some of the questions that are be that are being posed by the audience and to try to sort of lump them thematically. Um, Almar, let's 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 start with you and start with uh, the the first question. Um, uh, to the extent that legal pressure on companies is is part of, of, of the campaigning and the movement building. Uh, how can or, or can uh, legal pressure be increased uh, over different corporations, whether in the US or elsewhere, um, from, from a legal, legal perspective, not just in terms of damaging their reputation? Yes, indeed, legal pressure is part of what we do. But of course, this requires experts, legal experts. So in the United States, for example, Palestine legal is uh, the most uh, uh, well positioned to take on any challenge to a corporation. As far as I know, this has not happened yet. In Europe, we have the European Legal Support Center, which does a similar uh, job. Uh, the European Legal Support Center, for example, supports city councils in uh, adopting progressive procurement guidelines that exclude companies involved in grave human rights violations anywhere. They don't make it Israel specific. It's, you know, it's, it's a human rights screen, so to speak. Um, and that then becomes easy for Palestine activists to say, well, you've passed this policy, then exclude this company, HP, Puma, Caterpillar, you know, all the companies involved in Israel's violations on EU enlist. The UN has a list of companies involved in settlements. It's not a comprehensive list, but it's a starting point. Uh, uh, AFSC, American Friends, uh, they have a good list investigate uh, tool where you can look up those companies and how involved they are in the occupation. So, so there are many ways of, of, uh, of doing this, uh, um, but this research is absolutely necessary. Whatever you do, you've got to do this research. Legal uh, action requires experts uh, and it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of money, obviously. So we were not... Uh, um, quick to jump to a legal challenge to a company because it takes enormous resources. Only when it's extremely strategic and we can teach a lesson to other companies do we do this. But there is a potential because according to international law, directors of a company, those sitting on the board of any company that knowingly is implicated in human rights violations are liable. We can sue each one of them. Had we had the money, we could have done it a lot more. You see Israel's lawfare uh, all over the place. They have millions and millions of dollars. So they go to frivolous lawsuits everywhere where they, have, where they have no case. We have a very strong, compelling legal case against many boards of directors of those criminal corporations, like all US military corporations are deeply, deeply criminal. And not just US, UK, and, uh, but the US is the most because it's a partner in Israeli crimes. Uh, so we can take those boards of directors members uh, to court if we had the resources. So that's another area that requires a lot of fundraising and, and, and very targeted strategic campaigns, but it requires a lot of resources. And, and we, we're very aware of that. Thank you, Omar. Uh, Sandra, a, a question to you from one of our audience members. Uh, to the extent that uh, that you know, targeting corporations and uh, and companies in the U.S. Uh, is is effective. How effective do you think uh, it would be to transition to Christian Zionist groups who seem the most impenetrable, the most sort of invested in in the status quo of Israeli occupation? What would it take, uh, or if you have experience as well, to 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 tap into? But um, what could it take to to sort of break through that 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 barrier? 
you know, it's a it's a good question, and and people there have been campaigns to challenge, you know, the largest Christian Zionist organization, Christians United for Israel. Uh, the fact of the matter is that these organizations are very right wing. Uh, they are um, organizations that are anti black, um, anti immigrant. Uh, they are um, unfortunately groups that you know their hatred of Palest Palestinians is not unique. They they're equal opportunity haters. Um, and so you know how do we translate uh, a campaign? Um, I don't know. It's not specifically a BDS campaign. I think this question is about. But how do we you know impact uh, Christian Zionists? I think it's very difficult to do that with the approaches that we have taken um, at Adala Justice Project, for instance. You know, of really uh, making uh, partnerships with progressive groups. But I think it's important for us to recognize that there are um, especially uh, Black Christians who are taken in by a misreading uh, of Christian scripture, a misreading of the Bible, and uh, having gentle conversations with people to not say um, you're wrong <laughs> or your theology is mis uh, misguided, but really doing the political education, um, humanizing the Palestinian uh, people to them, um, you know, I've been in black churches um, and people will say, this is the first time I've met an Arab. This is the first time I've talked to anyone about, you know, about Palestine. And so we are not doing a good enough job of reaching um, into these uh, communities. Um, we, we have to be a little bit more, um, we have to reach out a little bit further and get out of our comfort zone. So that's what I would say. And I think that people who are, you know, involved in church organizing really could be doing more, uh, you know, visits, exchanges, uh, Palestine 101 kinds of things with uh, with black partners. And Omar maybe has something to add. Yeah, yeah, if I may add, at the height of church resolutions, you know, the Presbyterians, the United Methodists, United Church of Christ, at the height of that campaign to, to convince churches to divest from companies, banks involved in the occupation, I happened to visit the United States several times and I spoke at tens of churches uh, Protestant churches predominantly. In, in, in some of those churches, people were surprised to learn that Palestinians include Christian Palestinians. And I told them, what, do you think Jesus is French? I mean, seriously? <laughs> you did not know that Palestinians are Christians, Muslims and others as well, um, and Jews and, and, and so on? But to, to some of them, Palestinians meant Muslims, imagine. I mean, it is that level of lack of understanding. So it needs a lot of education. We do have very active groups in mainline churches that have done all this amazing work to convince their churches, their pension funds to divest. But as Sandra said, more needs to be done, especially with black churches, I think. And the last point is that with, with uh, Christian Zionists, it might be impossible. It's, it's a very long process and it has to come from within. But not all evangelical Christians are Christian Zionists. Sometimes people make that mistake, putting them together as if every evangelical person is necessarily a Zionist. They're not. And there's some young evangelical activists who are challenging this Zionist uh, uh, theology. Uh, the Palestinian uh, Christian movements like Kairos Palestine has played a very important role. Uh, um, uh, Friends of Sabil North America, several groups, AFSC and many other groups, Jewish Voice for Peace has played a crucial role in lobbying those uh, churches. One last point, and sorry this took a bit long, is that encountering Christian Zionists uh, Jewish activists as well as Palestinians remind everyone that th th at the root of their love for Israel is hatred for Jews. They're waiting for the Messiah to come to convert all Jews or kill them all. A genocidal, extremely racist uh, uh, concept. And, and when people realize that, they say, how is Israel aligning itself with such evil anti-Semitic forces? Well, that's what Israel does. It's an ally of every fascist party in the world, from India to Brazil, from East Europe to many African states. That's what Israel does. Thank you, Omar. Um, I, I want to ask, I want to lump a few questions together that are really about resources. And, and I'd like to ask it to both of you, since you, you both work in different contexts, uh, in the US, Europe, and the Middle East, and globally, and so on. Uh, this this question has come up in several question uh, in several in several of the um, questions posed by the audience. Wh where is the best source of information 
uh, for activists or people interested in getting involved, for them to know which uh, campaigns to support, which campaigns are underway, uh, which companies should be boycotted. Uh, this, uh, Omar, you mentioned already the, the UN list that came out, the AFSC is a good resource. Uh, but maybe we can say more about those, how to how to how to uh, access them and so on. But also other lists, other places, perhaps the BDS website as well. Um, Sandra, also uh, within the United States, and it's such a immense uh, country. What is the most effective way to find these sort of local uh, movements to join, depending on where you are in the United States? If that uh, if that makes sense, uh, Sandra, can we should we start with you? Sure. Um, you know, as I said, a lot of these campaigns really are built locally. And so if there isn't a campaign in your city, if there isn't a group already doing the work, it's beginning to sort of doing some power mapping and, and looking at where there are, uh, where there is complicity, where the companies are. Uh, for instance, in St. Louis, there are uh, several Israeli startups that have come into the city. They're being supported by uh, government grants, city grants, to set up shop here. Um, these are, you know, these are potential, you know, targets. So it really takes some time to think about like what what is vulnerable, what is the most vulnerable, what do people have the most access to. But on a general scale, you know, you can look, you know, the US campaign for Palestinian rights has a map of local uh, groups, grassroots organizations. So you can see what already exists in your city or nearby in your state. Um, and increasingly, you know, the fights within uh, many communities uh, focus around right now are focusing on uh, anti BDS legislation at the state level, uh, sometimes at the municipal level, and then increasingly now, um, the definition of uh, anti-Semitism that is being put forward by the IRA, IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which is conflating, um, you know, pro-Palestinian activism with anti-Semitism. It's a very dangerous uh, tool that's being put forward uh, not only at the state level, um, in governments, in city governments, in schools, in unions. Um, so you know, these increasingly are campaigns that people are working on um, that are not specifically BDS campaigns, but are, uh, you know, campaigns that are meant, you know, these kinds of um, tools that are being put forward by, by the pro-apartheid lobbies and pro-apartheid forces in this country are meant to shut down um, BDS campaigns, distract us, um, and keep us from the important work of organizing. Uh, on, on the other question, as Sandra uh, earlier said, there are no lists. Long lists never work because it takes a very, very revolutionary committed person to boycott 100 companies. I mean, it's really difficult. When you go into a supermarket, you have to do a lot of research to, to, to buy your basic stuff. So we stick to the most strategic campaigns, the most strategic targets, which are context sensitive, which are intersectional, which are winnable. If they're not winnable, they're not worth targeting. And, and sometimes targets might seem impossible, but I'll give a very good example from the US. In Oakland, California, uh, the Arab Resources and Organizing Committee, AROC, led in enormous work with trade unions, uh, dock workers unions, with the community, a huge involvement of the Palestinian community and our supporters in Black Lives Matter and so on, to block the port of Oakland, preventing an Israeli ship from uh, uh, um, delivering its cargo. And they did that day in and day out until the ship turned back. And this happened repeatedly after massacres, Israeli massacres in Gaza. This was how they reacted. It's not just anger, it's channeling your anger in the right way and making the complicit companies, in that case, it was Sim shipping company, Israeli shipping company, which ships all kinds of weapons to Israel and so on, making Zim pay a price. And that was their way. And it started with a small group organizing and reaching hundreds and hundreds of people in the community with trade unions and really making an impact. So there is the UN database. If you're looking for a divestment target rather than a boycott target, and they're very, very different. Divestment means institutional uh, target, you know, you, to your church, your trade union, your pension fund, you're trying to pressure them to exclude a list of companies. In that case, we suggest going after a general uh, uh, screen. So excluding companies involved in grave human rights violations anywhere. 
fossil fuels and, and so on. When you have those general guidelines, then you can push uh, um, companies involved with this really apartheid, settler colonialism, occupation, it becomes much easier. But if you try to pass in the city council a resolution excluding companies involved in Israel's settlements or occupation only, it is much, much more difficult. And it does not necessarily bring in all the other communities. Why should the city of Berkeley exclude only companies involved in settlements? What about companies involved in private incarceration of young black people in the United States? You know, or anti-immigrant companies uh, involved with ICE and, and so on. So we need to have a more intersectional approach to those uh, procurement and investment uh, screens. And then we can do a lot more uh, work. So there's the UN database for divestment. There's the AFSC investigate. There's who profits a group, an Israeli group that does enormous work in, in documenting um, up-to-date information about companies involved in Israel's violations of Palestinian rights. So you have those tools. And of course, on the BDS website, bdsmovement.net, you have the most global campaigns that have a lot of impact across the world where you can join in. If, if there is no campaign in your city, as Sandra said, start one. But start with clear strategic criteria. Don't just jump on something because it's a bad company. A bad company can be extremely difficult to win a campaign against, or it can be easier. I'll just add that uh, viewers should also go to the Adala Justice Project website to learn about uh, their campaigns and, and how to join them as well. Um, let's let's shift a, a bit from the corporate discussion and talk about cultural boycotts. This came up in one of the questions, and it's something I had in my mind as well to ask you, uh, Sandra. Uh, AJP has had, has had successes in the cultural boycott dimension. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, how cultural boycotts, their scope, their effectiveness, their limitations, um, you know, compared to some of the other campaigning you do, you've you, you've experienced around corporate boycotts. Uh, this audience member asked you, why don't we why don't we uh, target celebrities? They're singular singular individuals with huge followings. Um, we know to an extent that can be effective. Look at Bella Hadid or, or Mark Ruffalo and and so on. But what is it? Uh, what is what is a cultural boycott about? And and uh, maybe feel free, please, to share examples from your from your extensive experience. Well, I would say that we've won a lot of people um, in that realm in celebrity in celebrity them artists, uh, musicians, actors. They just haven't been vocal. <laughs> I think that there's a there is a silent boycott happening. Uh, there are so many, um, yeah. There are just a lot of people who are who are outraged and do not want to be affiliated with this apartheid regime and have withdrawn their um, yeah their appearances, their partnerships uh, very quietly, because who who wants the scrutiny that this is going to bring? It's very difficult for someone uh, to stand up. Um, Bella Hadid is obviously a Palestinian, so her, her motivations are a little different than someone, say, like Beyonce or others who maybe are not playing uh, Israel, but do not say so uh, directly. Um, you know, most recently, uh, you know, we had this, you know, a small success in that it's an indie band, they're a small band, but they do have cultural relevance, um, the band Big Thief. Uh, they, um, they were set to play at Barbie, a, a club in Tel Aviv, two nights uh, last summer. Um, and when they announced the dates, uh, there was an outpouring of outrage on their Instagram announcement. Um, Palestinians really, really disappointed with um, the band for making the decision to go there. Um, their lyrics are, are poetic. Their lyrics are about love, um, very deep. Um, you know, emotional uh, music. I'm a big fan of theirs. So I was also disappointed. I erased all of their <laughs> songs from my playlist on and on. Um, and then, you know, I just couldn't believe the thousands and thousands of comments that were pouring in. And, you know, I was like, so who do we know? How do we figure out what's happening with this band? Why would they make this terrible, terrible decision? You know, they're, one of the members of the band is an Israeli. And so the the, the reason they gave is that they were going to the home cities of all of their band members. Um, we found out that they were touring in Europe. We found someone who, who knew them. And what they told us immediately was that the band is reading every single comment. They're, they're, 
they're in anguish over over the you know the outrage that they're they're feeling uh, you know on, on social media and so i want to say you know that we have power <laughs> palestinians on social media have a lot of power um, people, you know, the band members were learning, they were understanding uh, why they shouldn't go. And then they, they made the decision not to play. They canceled the, the, the dates. They, and then, you know, uh, made a very strong statement about, about why they wouldn't appear. Um, and this is all to say that, you know, now when you look at the Barbie, <laughs> you know, dates, you know, the, the bands that are playing, they're mostly Israeli bands, you know, international acts are not, are not playing there. Um, so I think that we've done more than what we can brag about. Like we, we've done a lot, um, but a lot of that is a silent boycott. If I may add just very quickly to this, I agree with Sandra, the silent boycott is definitely much bigger than the public boycott, but the most successful campaigns have come after engaging the fans of those bands in an ethical, educating way, rather than hammering them with insults. In the BDS movement, we're against ad hominem attacks. We're against personal insults. This is not a way to campaign against anything. Even after Madonna, I can't remember when, eight years ago, played Tel Aviv and wrapped herself with the Israeli flag, we never attacked Madonna. We attacked the act of complicity. You're playing Tel Aviv. Art washes Israeli apartheid and settler colonialism. It art washes this criminal regime. But we never say you are a criminal, you are a hypocrite. We don't attack the person, we attack the act. What this does is that first, it is our principle, but, but pragmatically speaking, it shows the fans that we're not attacking their idol. We're saying that you know they can be great people, but they're doing something deeply, deeply wrong and deeply hurtful to our rights. And then we turn the fans against the artists. The fans start telling the artists, shame on you, why are you doing this? You should quit this. So this worked with Shakira, this worked with so many of the big names that otherwise wouldn't care less about Palestinians, honestly. But because of them, thousands and thousands of their fans every single day writing to them, you should cancel, you shouldn't do this, it, it works. The final point I wanted to say is that Israel is extremely alarmed by this Palestinian Black Alliance in the US by the Movement for Black Lives adopting uh, Palestinian rights as part of global rights that they support, they're extremely alarmed. And therefore, they really try very hard and they pay top money. I mean, playing Tel Aviv gives you more money than London, Paris, or any other city in the world. They pay more than anyone else to try to lure people. And they're focusing a lot on black artists in the US, the most famous black artists. It's not working with many of those artists because they do have principles and they see the community is against this. But with some artists, unfortunately, it is working. So we need to do more education and do more intersectional work in, in that realm. So, so that actually, that's that's something I wanted to get to, uh, the, the educational component of the work that you do. There, there's, And I think I would like to ask this to both of you as well because of your different um, you know, spheres of, 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 of organizing. Uh, to what extent do reports on Israeli atrocities, whether published by the, the UN or Amnesty International or B'Tselem or um, Human Rights Watch, calling out Israel on its war crimes and its apartheid, to what extent have these been useful tools or, or should they be used? Or are they, you know, sort of because the, the certainly Israel is quick to discredit them and to call them anti-Semitic and so on. Can they, are they possibly, uh, could, could they be a disservice in the work that's being done? Uh, I guess it depends what source they're coming from. But, you know, in the educational component of the work that you do, how do these reports uh, figure? Um, Sandra, let's, let's start with you. You know, in the work that I do, I don't know that, you know, people are looking beyond, you know, maybe the announcement of the report. I don't think that, um, you know, grassroots activists necessarily are reading, you know, a 200 page report from Human Rights Watch, but they are paying attention, right, to the headlines and they are paying very close attention to what Palestinians are saying uh, about the situation. And, and you know, the, the uprisings in the summer of 2021, the Unity Intifada, you know, we saw an outpouring of solidarity uh, across, you know, many, many different uh, sectors of the U.S. population. Um, people, you know, did come out. It wasn't a silent, you know, uh, you know, 
it was definitely a very vocal solidarity with the Palestinian people at that point. And what I'm realizing now as we began our organizing in 2023 is that the incubation period for how that solidarity turns into victories and wins and resolutions and BDS campaigns and divestments is a little bit longer than maybe what I uh, had in my mind. I thought I sort of thought, you know, OK, you know, May 2021 and we're going to see, you know, a, a rash of labor unions, pull, you know, making all kinds of statements about their commitment to Palestine. We're going to see, you know, universities again rising up. Um, but I think we're just at the point where these things are happening now. So maybe, you know, we have to be a little bit humble and realistic about how long these things take. Uh, People that are doing this kind of work um, in whatever context they're doing it are doing as volunteers. Uh, they are putting in labor that's you know in addition to their full time work or in addition to their um, their activism in their labor union in their university, and you know it's our job right to help get them to a point that get, makes them feel very strong that gets them to a point where they they feel like they can take that action. So. You know, and I don't know that the reports, they're studying the reports because I don't think they have the time to, but I think that all of these, you know, the cumulative, you know, um, understanding of what Israel is doing, apartheid is the least, right, the, the least of the crimes. It, you know, we're talking about, you know, a settler colonial regime using apartheid as a tool to that end, but obviously having these headlines in this mainstream attention on it is, is very, is very helpful. I guess the only thing I can add to what Sandra uh, said so eloquently is that um, people do not stand in solidarity with those who are just victims, unfortunately. People sympathize with victims, but they stand in solidarity with those who are resisting, those who have agency. Uh, uh, and that's a very, very important lesson that I personally learned through my activism against apartheid South Africa. I learned a lot from that struggle that you cannot just portray people as victims because you you deny them their agency as if they're just victims sitting there and taking those blows from a settler colonial apartheid regime. But we're not. We're not just steadfasting. It's not just about sumut. That's definitely part of our resistance. But we're resisting in so many ways. BDS is a form of our resistance. There's so many popular resistance movements in Palestine and among Palestinians in the diaspora. Most of our people are refugees, half of them are in the diaspora. We're resisting in so many ways. So people respect that. Uh, just a quick example. Once I was giving a, a, a presentation on BDS in, in Seattle, I believe, and then four Ethiopian students came up to me and said, can you explain to us how you started the G4S campaign? Because we're starting something in Ethiopia that's very, very interesting. And I thought, you have a BDS campaign in Ethiopia that we haven't heard of. And they said, no, 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 it's not related to Palestine. It's because G4S is also involved in private prison systems in Ethiopia, and we wanted to target a company there. And we saw that the only thing that anyone has done against G4S so successfully was the BDS, you know, the Palestinian-led movement. So we wanted to learn from your experiences. And that must have been one of the most beautiful activism moment I've ever had, that we're sharing experiences. And, and people look at you that you're struggling, you're resisting. Our enemy is extremely powerful, extremely, far more than apartheid South Africa. Yet we are making a dent. We are succeeding here and there, and we're resisting quite effectively. People respect that. And then you shift from sympathy, from charity to solidarity, effective, meaningful solidarity, which means above everything else, ending complicity. Before anything else, end complicity, state complicity, corporate complicity, institutional complicity. That's the ABC of solidarity. Thank you, Omar, for putting that also so eloquently. Uh, Sandra, if, if to talk more specifically about solidarity building, but within a uh, uh, sort of small business uh, sector, let's say. So we have a question from uh, from an audience member. How, how do small US-based companies that don't work in occupied Palestine or the international marketplace for that matter, support the movement? And I would add uh, specifically within the context of increasing criminalization attempts of, of pro-Palestine activism uh, in the United States. 
you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't given that a lot of thought, but the first thing that comes to mind is challenging these state laws, challenging these anti-BDS laws. You know, are you a small company that potentially could be bidding <laughs> on a state contract and, and becoming, you know, sort of a test uh, for for these uh, these laws, where when they make you, when they ask you to sign a pledge that you are not engaging in a boycott of Israel, would you refuse to sign that uh, that pledge and potentially become you know a plaintiff, right, in one of these you know uh, precedent-setting law, law, lawsuits? You know, um, the anti-BDS uh, laws uh, with that test case in Arkansas, the small newspaper that uh, refused to sign the pledge when they were you know, taking ads from the state government um, could potentially be going now to the US Supreme Court. Um, this is gonna have a huge impact on the future, not only of uh, the Palestine movement, uh, but on the ability of any uh, social movement to use boycotts as a tool, the tool of social change. I mean, this is becoming such a huge issue, not only you know, for Palestine, but as we see, you know, in Atlanta, um, people are protesting the cop city. We just saw a forest defender, you know, murdered by Georgia State Trooper. Um, there are so many corporations involved uh, with building that cop city. You know, the inter you know, I think it's so important to remember that corporations are bad actors. You know, they're they're not just. <laughs> <laughs> complicit in Israeli atrocities. They're complicit in a lot, a lot of crimes across the globe, um, across our movements, across our communities. And um, just to be, you know, thinking about like, as a small business owner, what could you do? Uh, what, who are your suppliers? Are you, you know, are you also complicit in, in how um, these companies are, 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 are working? Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Omar, there's a bit of a technical question and uh, three folks have voted on it. So I think this is um, uh, an important one to address. Does, does BDS have a way of measuring its effectiveness in terms of how much the movement is costing Israel or settlers um, in, U in US dollars? It would be worth having some measure in order to raise the morale of supporters. Uh, we wish it were that easy. Our enemy does not make it that easy for us. But of course, there are indicators. So it's not by dollars and cents. That's too. That's too much. It, it's not an NGO that can measure. You know how many uh, uh, our project, how many people were reached, and the gender. It can't be that way. This is a state, a very powerful state, supported by the world's only empire and by Europeans and so on. It's extremely difficult, but there are very important indicators. When you see that Israel has dedicated an entire government ministry for several years for fighting BDS with a budget of tens of millions of dollars, you know you're doing something effective. When some of the largest pension funds in the world, the Sovereign Fund of Norway, the largest in the world, divests from several companies and banks because of their involvement in settlements, you know you're doing something right. Uh, uh, when big churches, when um, you know, start divesting, when large corporations are leaving uh, Israel, because they no longer want to associate with an apartheid regime, you know you're doing something right, and so on and so forth. So there are many indicators, and we see from the Israeli reaction to our campaigns whether they're effective or not. But even before seeing the reaction, we don't start a campaign, as I said earlier, unless there's a reasonable chance of success, because we're not you know, romantic activists that want to see, you know, yeah, uh, liberty in some time in, in a thousand years. We want to see freedom in our lifetime. And therefore, we have to be strategic. We have limited resources. 99.9% .9 of us are volunteers, as Sandra said. We need to be extremely strategic and economical with our time and our capacity. And that's why we don't target anything unless there's a potential for success. So we, we are very uh, uh, goal-oriented, not just principled. We have to be goal-oriented. Uh, and we do always, every single year, we evaluate our campaigns and check those indicators. Is it being effective or not? Sometimes we abandon campaigns because they're not effective, but that rarely happens because we wouldn't start them if we didn't think they would be effective. I think it would be very uh, moving to end on that on that uh, on that note. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, 
This is one of the most engaging policy labs I've had the honor of facilitating uh, over the last two two years. So thank you so much, Sandra and Omar, for sharing your insights and incredible experiences in movement building around Palestine. Uh, not many know the painstaking and exhausting efforts that go into the very difficult work of organizing boycott movements, especially in the United States and other Western uh, countries. Uh, we shouldn't take this behind the scenes work for granted and our support for the campaigns you organize cannot stop at signing a petition or tweeting or retweeting or uh, resharing something on social media platforms. As we continue to watch the Israeli regime dig itself deeper into fascism and apartheid, movement building is arguably more needed now than ever to apply significant and long-term pressure on the Zionist movement. It's also worth seizing on the increased uh, popular support for Palestine we're witnessing across the world. Thank you both so much for showing us just how this can and must be done. Yatikum alf alf afia. Uh, I'd also like to thank our audience all over the world for attending uh, tonight's lab and for submitting such thoughtful uh, questions and comments. And as always, before we sign off, I'd like to remind everyone that Policy Labs are a crowdfunded program of Al Shabaka, so we do rely on your continued support. If you are able to donate, please do so by clicking on the donate link that should now appear on your screens. Thank you both so much, and thank you to everyone for attending tonight's lab. Good night.